Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm David Knight. It's Thursday, March 13th, 2014. Now, yesterday we covered an open carry rally at South by Southwest. And we've got some interesting reactions, reactions to show you. The purpose of the rally was to show people who don't normally see guns what it's all about. Something that they should not be afraid of, should not be intimidated with. They should have respect for it, of course, but look at the reaction of these three Asian girls. That sums it up precisely. Now, of course, this all began because there was a panel discussion at South by Southwest on Saturday with Bloomberg's mayoral group for gun control and a couple of other groups. They had a very tiny turnout. So we got together an armed carry that uh, showed people what it's all about, and it was about 10 times larger than the South by Southwest anti-gun event. As Kit Daniels points out, the march was organized in only a few days, even though the other groups had a very long time to plan their event, and it was a weekday to boot. So if they're going to try to censor guns on social media, as Bloomberg has met with Facebook and said they want to do, they want to treat it like pornography, well, censor this. Censor people walking around peacefully with guns, which is their right, their legal right to do that in Austin. Now, we had a tragedy at South by Southwest. We had, overnight, we had 25 people were struck by a drunk driver. Two have died, 23 are still in the hospital. Two of those patients are in critical condition. It's a real tragedy, but imagine that if this had been something around the gun event. Imagine what they would have done with this. We see how they use tragedies to try to further their social agenda. Now, of course, there was also a tragedy in New York. A building exploded. It wasn't a bomb. They didn't try to enact martial law like they did in Boston. Whenever they can, they try to use every crisis, every tragedy for their own purposes. And we need to understand that and not try to take guns away from people who are acting responsibly, just like we shouldn't take cars away from people who act responsibly. Or should we? That's a question that Kit Daniels put to people at South by Southwest. We're here in the Red River District of downtown Austin, Texas, where last night a suspected drunk driver crashed through a barricade, killing two people and injuring 23 others. Now we're going to ask some of the locals as well as the out-of-towners if we should consider banning cars, just like how gun control advocates are always demanding that we ban guns after a shooting. So did you hear about what happened last night with the... Uh, I just heard right now. Really? So what's your, what do you think about it? Drunk people suck. I think those kinds of things happen when you have a bunch of drunk people all together in one place. I hate to say it, it's almost like terroristic, like what happened last night is, is bad, yeah. I don't know. I guess there was an accident. I think that uh, people are idiots. Considering that the uh, driver drove a car and killed people using a car, do you think we should have a ban on cars? Probably. I think so. Ban cars, for sure. Absolutely. We should just ban everything. Ban everything. Ban yeah. pencils, ban knives. Hell, ban walking on the street because, hey, you can trip and fall and kill yourself. I mean, people are always saying we should ban guns after a shooting event, so maybe we should just ban cars too, right? No, um, but I, I, I don't think we should have uh, so many guns. There should be, I mean, there are weapons in the right hands. I mean, just like a plane can be used as a weapon. I do believe it's important to keep laws progressing towards reducing firearms and reducing cars and the use of cars. I mean, we should just stay in our bedrooms with yeah. mattresses strapped, strapped to us. Put put a straight jacket on you. And yeah, maybe I can put pillows over yeah, my head. They're not really comparable, though. I mean, you ban cars, people can't get around. You ban guns, people can't, I don't know, be stupid and shoot each other. It's, I think guns are, they're made to kill, like you don't get a gun thinking, oh, I'm just going to like, you know, play this. Guns are made to kill things and kill people, and I think people should, it should be harder for people to get guns. Well, I have a lot of guns myself, but uh, they never killed anybody. I mean, I don't, I'm not saying that I think you're crazy, but I think it should definitely be harder for people to obtain things that are made to kill people. I know it was like a certain right that we were given in the beginning, but I mean, at the end of the day, facts are facts. The Constitution is, what, two going on 300 years old? So, I mean, it was a whole different situation than now. Do you know that the reason the Founding Fathers wrote the Second Amendment was based on ancient philosophers such as Cicero, Livy, uh, and even Machiavelli, who was known for giving advice to tyrants, that they all wanted an armed population to defend against tyrants, and not so much for hunting. Did you know that? I did not know that. 
Now you know. If we're using the guns to like fight against tyrants, that would make more sense. But seeing as we live in America, I don't really feel like that's necessary anymore. Because you don't? I don't actually, you know. Because we're... We don't really need guns, I guess. The people are just going to get hurt. It's like, what's the point? I do realize that majority of the murders that happen around the world have been committed by governments, which has been termed democide. What's your take on that? Well, I don't believe in violence. Yeah, we should ban pizza. Hey, hey, pizza? Yeah, I'm fat, whatever. That's my choice. Personal choice. So you're saying that you're responsible and not the pizza, correct? Yeah, I, it's life choices. So you'd say that the driver was responsible and not the car, right? Hey, it's an instrument. So you would say the shooter is responsible and not the gun, correct? Yeah, I would. So You believe in personal responsibility? Yeah, I do. Now, in the filming of this report, I had to stay out of the way of multiple cars. I almost got hit by a golf cart at one point. Yet, we do not see Michael Bloomberg spending millions of dollars to fund an anti-car movement. This is Kit Daniels reporting for Infowars.com. Well, one way we respond is by showing people what responsible gun ownership looks like. Another way is at the state level. Look at this move in Missouri to nullify federal gun grabs. This is reported by the New American. They say that on March 6th, the Missouri House of Representatives Committee approved a bill to thwart the Obama administration's gun grabs. It has now moving to the floor for a vote. It has been passed by the Senate. Now, this is what the act says. It says all federal laws, executive orders, etc. I'm not going to read the entire thing, which infringe on people's right to keep and bear arms shall be invalid in this state. Do they have the right to do that? Of course they do. That's what the 10th Amendment is about. And of course, we have two recent SCOTUS decisions, Supreme Court decisions that stand behind the 10th Amendment on this very issue. We've got 1992 decision, New York versus U.S., and we've got Mack versus, and Prenz versus the United States. That was Sheriff Mack pushing back against the Brady Bill. That was 1999. So there is not only a clearly written constitutional amendment that constrains the federal government and gives, retains that power to the states, but there's also clear recent Supreme Court decisions as a precedent. Now we have an interesting story coming out of California. This is a gun parts manufacturer who successfully filed a restraining order against the ATF. For two years, they've been trying to get a list of 5,000 of his customers, and he basically stopped them with a restraining order. Jakari Jackson has this report. Ares Armor, a California gun parts manufacturer, has filed a temporary restraining order against the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives for fears the federal agency could soon bust down its doors. What the ATF has determined time and time again is that there is five operations on the AR-15 receivers that need to be uh, left undone that still need to be milled by the customer in order for it to be considered not to be a firearm. Here's the problem. A manufacturer has made one in plastic with different material and colors. This is plastic, this is metal. Which show the person building it exactly where to drill. Aries Armor says the ATF is threatening to shut them down if they don't hand over some 5,000 names of people, customers. Show that to everyone who says registration doesn't lead to confiscation. The ATF demanding customer records of a product they don't approve of. We already see magazines being banned in parts of California and Connecticut and guns banned in New York based on cosmetic features. And on the other side of the ranch, the ATF ran guns into Mexico under Operation Fast and Furious, a fact that the Attorney General Eric Holder perjured himself about. Attorney General Eric Holder was sent briefings on the controversial Fast and Furious operation as far back as July 2010. That directly contradicts his statement to Congress. Listen to what Holder told a Judiciary Committee hearing on May 3rd this year. I'm not sure of the exact date, but I probably heard about Fast and Furious for the first time over the last few weeks. Yet internal Justice Department documents show that at least 10 months before that hearing, Holder began receiving frequent memos discussing Fast and Furious. You can find more reports at Infowars.com. Well, while that restraining order may have temporarily stopped the ATF, of course, the NSA and the Department of Homeland Security are not restrained by orders or by the Constitution or by the FISA Act, 
which was supposed to restrain them from spying on domestic citizens. And now we learn from a FOIA document that Homeland Security is monitoring the Drudge Report. In order to track news websites and social media to gather critical information, quote, during normal operations, crises, and extraordinary events, in other words, during ordinary events and extraordinary events, in other words, all the time, they are monitoring media storylines, and they're going to integrate their focus into Homeland Security's situational awareness and operations analytical process. Well, why are they doing this? Well, of course, this is all about manufacturing consent. And this is why it's so important to guard the public's privacy and to keep the metadata, to keep the conversations on social media from being monitored by the government. They are constantly trying to propagandize us, to manufacture consent, and this is the way they get their feedback and see if it's working. And then adjust things and see how that affects the outcome. They want to know what you think, how you're responding to their propaganda. That's why they're monitoring these stories. Notice that they're not monitoring what they called first tier platforms. That would be places like the BBC or the AP or Reuters because they're just repeating the government propaganda line. They classify Drudge as being other sources, even though Drudge is not a source. Drudge is an aggregator. He links to these other news sites, but they count him as a source. Why? because he's just not putting out the government propaganda line. He's looking at the entire news spectrum. Now, guess who doesn't like being monitored? That's right, Daryl Issa, Dianne Feinstein, and Miss Lindsey Graham. They have now discovered that it's illegal, that it's an outrage. Listen to this reaction as they find out that the CIA has been listening to Senate Intelligence Committee members and their staffers. Issa rips the CIA over Feinstein's spying allegations and calls it Treason. After a year of the Snowden revelations, where's he been for a year? This is what he has to say. Spying on the executive branch, spying on Congress, violating the separation of powers. That's treason. It's written up in the Constitution. Well, actually, there's nothing about that in the Constitution. What the Constitution gives a definition of treason as is levying war. Is he saying that spying is levying war? Is he saying that Giving aid and comfort to the enemy is like giving information to the NSA. Does that mean the NSA is our enemy? There's some real troubling implications here, aren't there? But they're not concerned about you, even though they see spying as levying war and giving information to the enemy. They don't care about your situation. Look at what Feinstein said in the Washington Post. She said, this is a defining moment for Congress's role in overseeing the nation's intelligence agencies. And this is, quote, grave concerns, unquote, that the CIA had violated the separation of powers, unquote. Is she saying that the CIA is a branch of government? Are they a separate branch of government? Or are they, is she saying that they're the Praetorian Guard of our Caesar, our president? Very troubling implications. But finally, they're reacting because it's coming against them and not just against you and I. Now, unfortunately, the public doesn't still understand the importance of privacy and that they can't trade off their privacy for security. Look at this story coming out of California. Big Brother, small city, river islands will feature heavy surveillance. People are paying to get onto an island that has limited access and surveillance cameras everywhere and cops barking orders at people, reading license plate tags. These people are paying to get into all the aspects of the security state that you and I want to get out of. The scenic development surrounded by winding waterways is billed as a safe haven. Only four bridges leading in and out with security checkpoints and a fiber optic video surveillance program planned. Every license plate scanned on roads here will be cross checked with a DMV database for stolen cars. My wife and I are looking for a place that was safe for our daughter and so that's why we chose out here. It's good to have surveillance but it also it's, if it's too much it's invading our privacy also. Well that lady is starting to get it. Basically what these people are doing is they're buying homes in a maximum security prison. That's what they're creating as a prison. It's maximum security. Now, we all understand that even though we don't like it, the government is watching us constantly. And you know who else understands that? Bill Gates. And so he's going to be meeting face-to-face -face with 80 senators. You know, you don't want to...